Welcome to this lesson on solubility curves, the question of the day. Think about what this would look like. A sponge is saturated with water. A sponge that is saturated with water probably is full of water and is dripping water out of it because it is filled to the max. Now we can use that term saturated and unsaturated to describe solutions. So an unsaturated solution, let's say this is aqueous sodium chloride, that unsaturated solution is able to dissolve more solute, meaning that we could get more sodium chloride to dissolve in the solution if we wanted to. Looking at this beaker, you can't really tell that it is sodium chloride in here. It's just a water sample. And if we were to add more sodium chloride, it would dissolve quite easily. But if I had a saturated solution, things would be a bit different. A saturated solution does not have the capacity to dissolve any more solute, so it starts to pile up on the bottom of your container. Even just one grain of salt would be considered a saturated solution. You don't have to have a giant pile in order to be considered saturated, um, but that is obviously um, a key there. Sometimes a little stirring can get your one grain of salt to dissolve. Um, We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now our super saturated solution is a little bit different. It was kind of tricked into dissolving more solute than it should be able to, so you won't find anything sitting on the bottom of the container. The thing with a super saturated solution is that it's super delicate. If you agitate it kind of just right, you will get crystals to form. Um, so instead of having your crystals piled up on the bottom, they're kind of like just waiting for the green light to go and your solution will crystallize. It's actually really cool to watch and kind of difficult to, to figure out um, on your own. But if you were interested in trying it, making rock candy is a super saturated solution. You dissolve a crazy amount of sugar in water so much that it's like a thick syrup. And then you'll take a popsicle stick and a lot of the time you'll put a little sugar crystal on it. Maybe you'll dip it in just like some regular sugar and then add that to the solution. And then the crystals from that solution will like migrate over and stick to the popsicle stick where you already have some sugar crystals. So they will kind of undissolve from that solution and stick to the popsicle stick. You can do the same thing with borax. I know that's a common lab that teachers do. Uh, you dissolve a heck of a lot of borax in water and then you put in a pipe cleaner and then because the pipe cleaner is fuzzy, um, the borax crystals will kind of swim through the solution and they will stick to that pipe cleaner. It is really cool to do. A lot of teachers do it around Christmas time to make Christmas ornaments. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a perfect example of a super saturated solution. Solubility curves are graphs and they are going to show what a solution is able to dissolve based on the temperature of the solvent. Um, so the graphs look a little bit weird, but when you're looking at those graphs, it's typically a curvy graph. And when you have um, the, the graph is formed at the point of saturation. So once you hit the saturation point, you'd make a data point and then you connect all those data points and you get a nice smooth curve. Here I have graphed for you the solubility of potassium chloride in 100 grams of water. Here we have the grams of solute, which would be the calcium chloride. And over here we have the temperature in Celsius of the water. So you can see that at zero degrees Celsius, like right when water wants to be freezing, um, it's freshly a liquid. We can get just over 25 grams of the potassium chloride in there. But as the temperature rises, we are able to dissolve more and more potassium chloride. Now, this entire region underneath the line is going to represent an unsaturated solution of potassium chloride, meaning that on this line, that is where the solution is saturated. So, of course, anything below that would be unsaturated. Again, the data points that build the line represent the solution freshly saturated. Now the region above the line that I have left uh, white here, this is a little bit tricky because <laughs> if I have, let's say uh, a 50 Celsius water sample and I'm dissolving KCl in there, I would probably hit, I don't know, this is a really wide cursor. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it's 35 grams. 
uh, I can fit 35 grams of KCL in there and then it stops dissolving. So that would be 35. When I hit 36, 37, 40, 50, 60, all of that is just going to pile up on the bottom of the container. So if my solution is heterogeneous, meaning I have some solids sitting on the bottom, that's going to represent the saturated solution. But if that solution looks homogeneous, it looks the same throughout, then that means that this solution had been heated quite a bit very quickly um, so that we could get like some extra solute to dissolve. So that would represent the super saturated KCL solution. So um, only if it is homogeneous above the line will that solution be considered super saturated. The amount of solute that can dissolve in a sample is going to be based on temperature. While that's true, concentration does play a part. So um, in reading these curves, it's not so bad. <laughs> if you have 100 grams of water, which is what most of these solubility curves are based on, um, you just read the data. But let's say you had 200 grams of water. Well, if that's the case, then you would be able to double the amount of solute dissolved. So if your data point reads 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius is 60 grams of solute, if you double the water, it'll now become 120 grams of solute able to dissolve. Also, if you cut it in half, if you cut the amount of water in half, you will also cut the amount of solute able to dissolve in half, and that is true for any increment. You can also manipulate the temperature here. So if you have a hot solution and you cool it down, you will be able to dissolve less solute. And when that happens, you can have a precipitate. So a precipitate is an insoluble solid, meaning it's going to undissolve basically, and it's going to sink to the bottom of the container. Now, sometimes we get precipitates from chemical reactions and other times we get precipitates just because we have a drop in temperature and our solvent isn't able to hold as much solute as it used to be able to. So now all that stuff is undissolving and sinking to the bottom of the container. Using a solubility curve, of course, you can predict exactly how much solute is going to precipitate or undissolve. We can use this to our advantage in a lab process called a crystallization. So if we have something that's not a pure compound and we dissolve it in water, um, we can do that just by heating up the water. As that solution cools, a lot of the time we'll put it in an ice bath to get the solution to cool at a faster rate. And what happens is that the, the pure stuff is going to undissolve and it'll crystallize in the container and then you can kind of scoop that out and filter it to dry it. In order to dry it, we would put it into um, the Buckner funnels, I think they're called, and that's going to have like a little piece of paper. We're going to connect it to a vacuum pump to kind of pump out all the air and force all the water through so your dry crystals will sit on top. These are some crystals that I made in college. Uh, they're formed by a crystallization. The beaker had just been removed from an ice bath, and you can see I have all of these beautiful crisscrossing crystals. They are gorgeous, but there is a water level in here, and whatever water is in here is not pure, but the crystals are. The crystals are going to, um, just like in the rock candy, how you had a little bit of sugar to kind of seed the solution to get the crystals that are dissolved to migrate and stick. That's kind of what happens here. Um, you'll have one molecule of this crystal and then another one swims up and they kind of build these crystals slowly. That's what's happening here. So that's how you know that the crystals are pure. It's because one builds on top of the next. So here's my funnel. I've poured the crystals in and there's a little piece of filter paper underneath this funnel and that is going to draw water in. This like side arm on the flask is going to be connected to kind of like a Bunsen burner type hose, but it's connected to a vacuum. So it sucks the air out of this flask. And in order to replace the air, air is going to pass through the crystals, through the filter paper, and there's little holes in this filter. So it's going to suck air from the atmosphere into this flask and out into the vacuum. But as that happens, it is also going to pull the water down. So that yucky, impure water that was surrounding the crystals is going to get sucked and it's going to sit at the bottom of that flask. And then I can take these crystals and depending on their melting point, I could maybe put them in an oven to dry them up or I could just let them sit and let any excess water dry out. 
right here we have a lot of solubility curves. Um, this again is the New York State Chemistry Reference Tables, which I think are a great resource. So what happens here is that we have lots of lines, some of them more curvy than others. Notice that this is based on dissolving in 100 grams of water. Remember the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So even though this says 100 grams, it also means 100 milliliters of water. And this right here is going to represent the uh, temperature of the water. So if we look at, let's say, I don't know, this right here, this point right here is the point of saturation for KNO3. And that would be based on maybe 53 Celsius. That would be about 53 degrees Celsius. And that would mean if we scroll over to the right, that we could dissolve about 90 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 milliliters of water if the temperature of the water is 53 Celsius. So that is how you read this table. Um, obviously this point here would still be 53 Celsius. What it is telling us is that 80 grams of solute are in here, but because we're under the line for KNO3, it means that we haven't saturated the solution yet. And if we were to add just 10 more grams of solute, our solution would be saturated. One final thing I wanna point out is that it's kind of weird that some of these lines are going down. You can see that one's hydrochloric acid. Um, then right here we have ammonia, NH3. These lines are decreasing as the temperature rises. We have SO2 right here. And is there one more? No, that's all. Okay, so that was NH3, SO2, and HCl. And because those lines are dropping as the temperature is rising, that should tell you that these particular substances are gases because their solubility is decreasing as the temperature is increasing for the water there. Um, so those are gases. And of course, all the lines that go up represent solids. So that's what I have for you on solubility curves. I know this table is a little bit crazy. A lot of the time when you get questions, you'll have just like one table to look at. Um, but if you have to look at a crazy table, I like to have a second color pen or highlighter to be able to draw on the table and kind of pick out specific points because these can get a little bit crazy. Um, so please subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson. We're going to continue working with solutions. Leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.